Your tongue is still your own. Your listen body, yours alone. Speak, your life is still your own. Look into the blacksmith's forge, the flame blazes, the iron ring. Look unfastened upon mounted, every chain sling springy white. Speak, a little time suffices. Before the tongue, the body die, speak, the truth is still alive. Speak, say what you have to say. While celebrating the freedom of speech and justice, equality, liberty, and fraternity, the golden jewels enshrined in the Constitution of India, I.J. Donika Achumi, welcome you all to this August gathering. Today's important event will be chaired by me and moderated by Professor Lerite Yu Kutso. Today we are immensely happy to organize the first seminar in the Talk Talk series in collaboration with the Department of Political Science. Our seminar series is called the New Nagaland A Step Forward. We are truly fortunate to have with us an eminent personality in Nagaland, Sri Kahoto Chishisumi, as inaugural speaker who will be delivering a talk today on the Naga journey, need of realism and invention. About the speaker, Kaudu Chishi did his schooling from St. Edmunds College, Shilong, Meghalaya, studied at Science College, Kohima, and graduated from Fazi Ali College, Mokokchu. Grandson of Sheikh Pusema, Chief GP of Lokobo Village, who risked the British colonial government displeasure by granting permission to the American Baptist missionary to set up the first Sunni Christian center at Aizuto Town. He is the sixth and the youngest son of Nivaku Sema, a pioneer of Mokokchun Town, who was instrumental in establishing the town higher secondary school, Fazi Ali College, Sunni High School, and Nivaku High School. Sumi is presently, presently Chief GB of Halikshi Village, established by his father in 1969, while his elder brother, Inato Chishi, continues as Chief GB of Lokobo Village. Sumi has written more than 140 articles and published in the local papers and political, social, cultural, and religious issues confronting Nagaland. With a vast following in Nagaland, especially among the youth, he has appeared multiple times on national television, has been quoted by national print media, and is a favorite subject of interviews. And on the multitude of issues arising in Nagaland for YouTube channels of Nagaland. Now, with your permission, I request Sri Kaudu Chishi to kindly take the charge of the dais. Stage is all here, sir. Good morning, evening, and good evening. I would like to thank the principal and faculty of Ritzo College for giving me this opportunity to address you. And also to thank all of you who are attending this talk. This is the second time I'm appearing here at Ritzo College. My only appearance was during the pandemic. Coming back to the topic, uh, I would like to explain the reason why we Nagas are facing so many uh, confusion on so many issues. It is uh, a common phenomenon when when an advanced culture comes to contact with a primitive culture, it is natural that the primitive people, when exposed to new thoughts, new ideas, and new institutions, they go into a state of cultural shock. And this is what is happening in Nagaland. We, in a few short years, everything around us has changed. Knowledge which was passed down from father to son has now suddenly become this formalized thing, education system. Religion was very simple. We appeased good and evil spirits 
But now we have all different new religions, doctrines, the rituals, and the ceremonies, and governance also. Like our village, villages were independent, self-governing societies. Now we have uh, inter, not only tribal, but inter-tribal, inter-ethnic communities living under one form of government. So all of this has created confusion and uh, we have we seem to have lost direction. Our educated people do not know the purpose or the value of our education. And this is reflected in many aspects of our lives. So starting with the first term, the term Naga itself. Yeah, the most probable uh, group of the word I believe is the Kachin word Noka, which means pierce ear. ears. Now I grew up in a time when I saw my elders with huge holes in the ears, not the present thing, small piercings. And it was because uh, they used to have a sort of mineral, white mineral, a big cube. And through the course of time, like the old, uh, ear holes would expand. So that, I believe, is the most proper origin of the word Naga. Now, this term Naga has been used to identify the different ethnic uh, groups of populations, not tribes, in the present state of Nagaland, Manipur, Assam, Arunachal, and Myanmar. Now, the confusion arise has a reason about the term Naga with the advent of the Asian iron. See, people think that uh, I don't like uh, the Asian iron, that I am a powerful passion. But that is not true. I just state facts as they are. There was no confusion about who considered himself a Naga and who did not. This confusion arose only in the early 90s when uh, the NSN Aryan, in an effort to strengthen its uh, political hold, started inducting non-Naga tribes, especially the old Oki tribes, into the Naga board. And this confusion is still here up to the present. So as educated young men and women, you should always try to find out what are the facts behind any issue and what has led to this issue arising. So now we are in a state where we have a multiple thing, uh, Naga tribes and among the newly inducted Naga tribes there are, there are division among them. Some want to be Nagas, some don't want to be Nagas. And this has spread to where the recognized Naga tribes don't want to be known as Nagas. Also. So that we must be very well aware of who we are, what our identity is, and who we want to become. With regard to governance, we, uh, we were self-governing societies. In a village, we knew each other. We were related to each other. And we knew the laws which governed us. There was no confusion. But with the advent of uh, colonialism and then uh, nationhood, Indian nationhood, and again statehood, uh, statehood, we have become a law of society. Our state government functions only for the purpose of misusing funds. Our village societies, our village councils, and our civil societies, our churches, 
everybody is after money. And this has risen because we do not understand the concepts. The Nagarin Village Council Act was passed in 1978. It tried to formalize the traditional Naga governing class, sort of. So they gave the example of the Ao, the Putumedam. So these people, they, the Putumedam, they take turns. The clan, the clans who form the village, they change the governorship every 30 years. It's been reduced to 15 now. And this, this is just an example. Now you have uh, the Yukon tribes, they are the Kilimsuas, no? So these, and then uh, the Angami, I believe it's uh, Pehemia. Lota, Lota is uh, Tonki. So all these, these are the people who should form the British councils. These are the people who should be the Gambaras. But now we have reached a stage where the politicians are choosing who should be the Kamparas, the politicians are choosing who should be the village councils. The original act was called the Nagaland Village and Area Council Act. This area council was repealed because they started acting, they started exercising powers beyond their legal status. Now, the, the recent confusion is the amendment in 2010, which has renamed the Nagaland Village and Area Council Act, the Nagaland Village and Tribal Council Act. Now it says that tribes can form tribal councils, like our apex bodies, or groups of tribal councils, like the CNTC, ENPO, Kenimia uh, Union. But the problem is, this is not a legally valid act. Because it states that we should form these councils according to our customary laws. Now, Naga customary law does not recognize any authority other than the police council. So, these tribal councils, they have no authority under Naga customary law. They are operating under Article 191C of the Indian Constitution, the right to form unions and associations. Now, the Nagaland Village and Co Tri Tribal Council Act has tried to subvert our customary rights by passing, by trying to legalize a something which has no legal basis. So this is, it is because of laws like this that confusions arise in society. When I challenge an apex tribal body like the civil war, I know that they have no standing under any law. They have no authority over me. But they try to use the excuse of this uh, act which has been passed by SME, the Nara Tribal uh, Village and Tribal Council Act. So now to challenge that, I have to go to court. I know that I will be in court, but I have to spend money, I have to spend time. So it just comes down to a quarrel on social media or print media. So these, our own leaders, our own people are creating confusion amongst us. And their purpose in creating this confusion is so that they can carry on and hinder their, their business of looting us. They, they have not a concerted policy it seems to be a concerted policy to keep us confused. We have we hear all this talk of the solution, this is coming, that is coming. 
all all unnecessary issues were brought up, but nobody mentions the real issue, the root of all the confusion, all the trouble in Narayan, which is corruption. Corruption in every field, every department, and every sphere of society. So, as educated young people, you should be aware of that. Always try to get to the core of an issue. Think, reason. Then you will understand. Don't just accept everything that is given to you. Don't swallow all the lies. Always filter. Always think. And always use reason. No. Uh, last year, I was uh, privileged to address a seminar in Wati, the Northeast Human Rights Law Network. And there I mentioned that in an ordinary society, you have the government, you have the civil societies, you have the institutionalized religions, you have the print media and you have the criminal, organized criminal syndicates. Now, these five elements, they are supposed to be against each other in one way or the other. But in Nagaland, these five elements, they have combined together to suppress the rights and the privileges and the opportunities of the ordinary people. The government is into rampant corruption. The civil societies are hand in glove with them. In my recent interview, I talked about that. How election to our apex tribal bodies is manipulated. I give the example of the civil thing. Oh. So in one way or the other, the government selects the civil societies and then the church is either actively indulging in corruption or is silent about corruption. The media also is silenced and the undergrounds have taken over the role of the organized criminal syndicates. So we must be aware that nobody is fighting for the common people. Nobody is voicing out the grievance of the common people. Because all these institutions of a normal society are working hand in glove to suppress the ordinary person. You are from a privileged section of the Naga society because you have access to an edu to education in a good institution. But there are thousands of other Nagas who are living in the villages who do not have access to basic education, who have no hope of ever entering college. So, what do you feel you must do? Are we so selfish? We call ourselves Nagas. We are trying to identify as a group of people, as a single Naga society. But when you do not care about the less privileged among you, what is your purpose? Is your purpose in life solely to make money by any means possible? I want you to think and to tailor your lives according to a certain purpose. It's okay if you want to make money. But learn how to make money in ethical ways. Not by stealing from the weak. So, this is what we have become. Anaga people we have become a band of robbers and depending on the level we are stealing from the rich are stealing from the less rich the less rich are stealing from the poor no, these levels so we have to face reality and we have to change direction otherwise we will not survive as Nakas. We will not survive as Sunnis, as Anamis, Rehmas, whatever. 
will only survive as rich and poor. There is a there is a definite line between the rich and poor among the last day. You have people who are spending money hand over fist blindly, and you have people who are struggling to make. 10 or 20 rupees. How did this, this come up in such a short time? Nagas were always equal. Somebody might have had a little more cattle than you, somebody might have had more grain than you, but you didn't start. We didn't have uh, different classes in society. But now we have reached a stage where there is a definite line between the rich and poor and it's going to get worse. So we have to think of that. So, governance, then religion. We, the majority of Nagas, we call ourselves American Baptists. Now, what is American Baptism? It is Puritanism, strict orthodox. Now suddenly, we are seeing uh, people who call themselves uh, American Baptists who having visions, talking about donating money to the churches. And if you donate money, they are implying that God will give you more. That has nothing to do with uh, the American Baptists. Our churches are not looking after the less privileged among us. What we have done is we have perverted American baptism with uh, revivalism. We call it revival. But actually it is from an independent church in Australia, Vegesta, which has been influenced by the prosperity churches. So we have a mixture of the Pentecostal visions and faith healing uh, combined with uh, prosperity churches preaching, saying that if you give to the church, God will give you more. If we to build uh, churches, what grows, tens of grows. When our neighbors can hardly afford one meal a day, what is the purpose of building a church? What is the purpose of a pastor driving around in a luxury car? Don't you understand the absurdity of calling ourselves American Baptists? What we see on the TVs, this American TV preachers, they are not American Baptists. Those are just con men. So learn to use, read the Bible, read Matthew, Mark, you can join. That is Christianity. I challenged the NBCC in a prior article, I wrote about a reduction of Christianity. I said that the NBCC has reduced Christianity to prohibition and closing shops on Sundays. They would not reply. It is true. And both of them have no grounding in Christian theology. Where in the Bible does it say that you, you shall not drink? Where in the Bible does it say that uh, the Sabbath is on Sunday? The Sabbath is on Saturday. So they use these false principles to make us believe that they're doing something good for society. In 2020, the Moral Foundation and Moral Express newspaper, they conducted a seminar, a debate on this issue. Uh, NBCC did not turn up officially, they did not turn up. And those who turned up, they could not say anything on behalf of prohibition. We have to understand whether it's 
our government, or whether it's our churches, whether it's our, whether it is our ethnic civil bodies, we have to question them. Why are they doing these things? And the only way you can question them is if you know something about it. See, growing up, I had to search around for books. But for you, it is so easy. You, you have it in your hands, in your phones, Google. You can search anything. You can find anything. So use it. Use the tools that you have. You are a fool if you do not use what you have. You will be misled. You have to understand this. The majority of people are too lazy. They are too lazy to do their own thinking. So they are, they are misled, easily misled by evil people. So if you don't want to be misled, you have to think for yourself, you have to search for yourself. So understand this. Your religion, your denomination, the way you worship, how regularly you worship, will not grant you salvation. It is your deeds, how you treat humanity. The Bible says, God made man in his image. Jesus Christ said, he destroyed his temple, I will rebuild it in three days. He meant the body. This is the temple of God. It is not a stone house outside. So understand, salvation comes through your deeds, not through your worship. The church is there to strengthen your faith, to strengthen your works with like-minded people. You do not find your faith in the church. The faith is in you. So understand. Don't believe people just because they have degrees. Just because uh, they are called to certain institutions. God has given all of us the ability to understand and the ability to choose. You can choose to blindly follow people or you can choose to think. So the choice is yours. So don't be misled by religious dogma. Coming to education. Our, this, I'll call it the Western system of education. This system of education is one of the greatest evils that Nagas have faced. You have to understand how education developed. See, education is there to pass on knowledge. It's well and fine, but other societies, they have gone through the process of gaining knowledge and skills and passing that through education. We were just hunter-gatherers who had barely made it into the agricultural age when all the modern forms had descended on us. Now we're using phones, we're using cars, we're building houses, we're building roads, bridges. But how many Nagas know how to do that? No, what? we must focus on is vocational training. We need, Nagas need mechanics. We need carpenters, we need masons, we need blacksmiths. And if you have those skills, you can become rich. I've seen with my own eyes. Um, the mechanic uh, I repair my vehicle with, I've been with, I've known him for 30 years. From a mere, he doesn't even know A, B, C also. 
Stanford, I believe uh, he scored around five to other mobiles, two boleros, always here. He scored his workshop, which is always filled with labels. So you have to understand the purpose of education. Now, if you want to go into the army or the police, plus eight or plus ten is enough. If you want to appear for civil services exams, graduation is enough. If you want to teach, then you can go for your MA, MPhil, PhD. But what is the purpose of going for higher studies when you're going to eventually settle on a job which does not require your thing? Years of academic learning. I'm sitting, I'm standing in front of you. I don't remember using uh, the mathematical knowledge I learned you know, up to class 12. So, I'm not denigrating what you're doing, but I want you to understand why you're doing it. It's okay. You're in college now. If you're going to try for a government job, stop the BA. Don't waste your time, don't waste your parents' money studying your doing MA, MP, and PhD. You go for all these higher levels of studies only if you want to teach. Similarly, you teach your less fortunate villagers or people you know. Not, it is not necessary that they start going to college. Now, when you look at developed countries, you see that hardly 30% of them enter college. They stop the high school after them. But their advantage is they have vocational training. So, God willing, in the future, we will understand the need for vocational training. But as of now, I want you to understand, I want you to think why. You have to know what you're studying. What is your purpose in life? And I'll tell you, if you want to be happy in life, you pursue something which you like. The way you will find content. You see all these Naga big shots, whether they're ministers, officers, technocrats, none of them are happy. The money that they look gives them the illusion of happiness. But when you look deep down, you see none of them are happy. They don't have peace of mind, they don't have job satisfaction. Job satisfaction is something which Naga still don't understand. Only a person who is doing something he loves will do that. Even me, I'm not doing something which I like. For me, the rural life, not farming, that is best. I love it. I love walking around with paddy fields. Uh, without electricity, I don't care. Without roads, I don't care. But because of social pressure, peer pressure, like people, they will say, ah, what do you do? What have you studied? No, and then we have this need to always uh, project a magnified image of ourselves. So, as educated young men and women, understand what you're studying and what you want to do in life and act accordingly. So these are the few ways in which we have lost our way and we need to touch reality. <coughs> now coming to civil societies. Civil societies grew out of a need to address the imbalances in society. Okay? When the Industrial Revolution came about, the working class was born. And the capitalists they exploited the working classes. And that's when these unions and associations they were formed to fight for the rights of the working class. Now this has expanded. Now we have different unions, different associations which are meant to fight 
for its members. But in Nagaland, we have formed unions, associations to enrich the exilient members. So we take our apex tribal bodies. They have never actually addressed the, the, uh, the problems, the hardships of the members of the tribe. Recently, in a Facebook group, uh, they were deploring the state of the roads in Zimbabwe. So I questioned, where is the semi war? Then people started quarreling with me. It is the purpose of the apex tribal bodies to ensure that the development and justice is granted to the members of the tribe. It is not their pur purpose to just sit there, attend every government meeting, and to give their lot to government boxes. So similarly, here also, you see this Dimaburoto Union, the presidents, uh, they live in luxury, whereas they are supposed to be representing the auto driver. They never do anything for the benefit of the auto driver. So, this is what we have become. Now, that is the pressure group. Then you have the non-profit organizations. These organizations develop to fill gaps where the government could not cover the problem of society. But in Nagaland, we have not non-profit organizations, but for-profit organizations. You see all these so-called social do-gooders, huh? advertising what they're doing, uh, skill development, uh, feeding the poor, whatever. I don't know what they do. And you look at how they live. They live like millionaires. Now, if there were rich people who were investing part of the money to help the weaker sections of society, that's okay. But all their wealth has been accumulated through the funds which the government of India has given for to uplift the poor. So we have to understand that our civil societies there are a few of them who are doing good. I don't deny it. But the vast majority of them are out to make money for themselves. You have to understand that. They do not represent you. They do not speak for you. They speak for themselves and for their vested interests. So, as before, think, filter, and reason. <coughs> now, coming to nationalism, I am very surprised when uh, discussions on this nationalism comes. Like we seem to have no idea of what nationalism is, what is their purpose. Where we are headed. The Naga National Movement was started by the NNC, which formed the FGN, the Federal Government of Naga. Now, recently, we're hearing things about the flag in the Yazabo, the Yazabo being the Constitution. Now, I have tried to bring up this issue multiple times on this Northeast line, hey, to be sure, but every time I've been shot down, either by the anchor or by my co-panelists. They just don't seem to understand what they're asking for. And the same with Nagas. We should be questioning what does the Yazabo entail? What does it mean? Now the NNC of GN Yazabo was a democratic constitution based on parliamentary lines. But the NSN constitution is totally different. It is a totally communist agenda. 
It talks about a one-party government. It talks about a president with all executive, uh, executive and financial powers. It talks about nationalizing all our land, all our resources, all our rivers, all our animals, transportation. And I am surprised that so many educated Nagas are so thick, gung ho about the fact that the NSTN is going to get the Yazabo uh, included into the Indian culture. It's not going to happen. But the fact that it's not going to happen does not change the fact that we are so stupid. How stupid are we? Think. You see, all these people now are self proclaimed leaders and are government uh, protected leaders talking about the flag and the constitution the flag and the constitution i said leave the flag aside let's talk about the constitution but nobody is willing to discuss that so these are the ways some of the ways in which we are facing confusion and crisis so as stated earlier okay it is natural it is natural for us to be confused by all these issues. But how do we go about addressing these issues? What is the direction we should take? And that is just simple. Try to act ethically, not morally. Morality differs from person to person and from culture to culture, from religion to religion. But ethical behavior is the same across humanity. Honesty. Honesty, right dealing. These are, these two are the basis of ethical behavior. Justice, if you are honest, if you behave properly, then everything else follows. So, what Nagas need to do is to start behaving ethically. Whether you work in the church, whether you work in the government, whether you work in the underground, or civil society, media, or even whether you're going to contest elections. You have to behave ethically. Because no matter who lectures you, who says what, as long as you yourself do not behave ethically, you cannot do anything against those who behave unethically. My greatest strength has been that I've got no hope for anybody to hang anything on me. I have tried to act ethically both in my private life and in public life. People say that uh, I'm very famous. I said, no, I'm, I'm infamous. No Naga has ever had, had as much enemies as I have. No Naga has ever uh, been so thin, uh, uh, egalitarian, you can say, in the class of his enemies. I've got enemies uh, rich, poor, not. I love him so. But the reason why they cannot do anything against me is because everything I do, I try to do it ethically. So I urge upon you, if you want to bring change into the Naga society, and start behaving ethically in every walk of your life. Because that is the only thing which can save our society. Thank you all. <laughs> if there are any questions, uh, is it most to come to? Thank you, sir, for sharing your eye-opening thoughts. We are indebted to your knowledge and wisdom.
Now I request Professor Lerke to kindly come to the dais and open the series for discussion and questions. He has given us different dimensions, different areas where our society has left behind, where we have fallen short. So let's grab this opportunity and also take this opportunity to share your thoughts, clarify from our sir. So I invite our sir to the dais and we can start with the interaction session. So I invite our students to come up with your questions. The stage is open. Hello. Please feel free to ask me questions of anything. It does not necessarily have to be the one I'm saying now. But you will get any thoughts. I'll try to verify and answer as best as I can. Good morning, sir. Uh, my name is Motun. I'm from the Department of Political Science. Um, in the beginning of your speech, sir mentioned about um, the addition of the old Kuki tribes into the Naga Fall. Um, and I am from Manipur, I'm a Naga from Manipur, and we have often been claimed that we belong to the old Naga tribe. So my question is on what basis, um, like is there any basis why um, we have been clubbed or rather allegedly been clubbed into the old Naga tribes and been added later? See, as far as I know, okay, the first uh, study of the different tribes of the Northeast was done by the British. And they were the ones who classified us as Nagas, Kukis, and Urkukis. And the main basis of this classification was linguistics, language. So, uh, you know from which tribe? No, Mari, yes. I want to bring that out. No? Because Annals and Maris, no? I believe they are the most victimized among the tribes of money. Because on one hand, you have the thing, uh, and the I am telling you that you're Nagas, on the other hand, you have Oki insurgents in the Oki. So, uh, so, see, you yourself will be in way, no? your language, no? with whom it has more affinity with. And I believe that this confusion arose only after 1992 trade. Okay. And it was brought up by innocent Island. They have a definite see NSL Island is one of the most powerful groups in Northeast India. And the reason is because they are very highly developed intellectually. They know how to function. They know what to do, they know their purpose, and they know who and what organizations to use to achieve their purpose. So, if I'm not mistaken, earlier there were eight Nara tribes from Manipur. Okay, eight tribes who were considered Nagas in Manipur. Now I believe it has increased, no? So, all this is part of the policy. So it is, I understand the environment you're living under, okay? I have friends among the Tangle communities and they tell me also. So I understand the pressures you are facing, but you will have a day will have to come when you have to speak out on what you believe is your true identity. It is not for me or for someone from outside to define who you are. It is for you yourself to define who you are. So that's all I can say. From the students. Good 
evening, sir. My name is Sado. I'm from Politics Department. Uh, and my first semester, uh, since you've been talking about religion, uh, I want to hear, uh, I want you to publicly denounce the practice of uh, selling uh, those offerings that people make to the church. So, uh, <coughs> uh, it's like, for example, we both go to church and you offer some uh, precious materials to the church and they sell it. But uh, those offerings are so, uh, aren't they supposed to be shared to the poor, poor people? So I want to publicly denounce the practice. Thank you. Thank you. That is very courageous of you. Now oh, it is like when you look at children, not from other parts of India or the world, and another children, no? there's a vast difference. Okay, you have children in other parts of the question their parents may be asked to so. But here too we just plan to accept. So so good of you to come here and to speak out your mind about the offerings you means are the, the, the goods no? like the uh, first flowers. No? So that is the crux of the, my issue with organized religion. No really Mahatma Gandhi said it right when he said, I love Christianity, but I hate Christians. But there is a clear distinction. The principles which Christ taught and what we are practicing under Christianity have no connection. Christ talked only about helping people, helping the less fortunate. And the parable of the Good Samaritan, no? how many of you are aware of that? The pastors, uh, they never talk about these things. It is about a man who was robbed, beaten and left to die, and the various Jews who pass it. And it was only a Samaritan, a non-believer, who treated the injured man. Now, this translates into the concept that it is not your religion which will save you, but your deeds. And as my young friend pointed out, our church is doing nothing to help the poor. So thank you for bringing that up. Any more questions? Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Tojin Kumla, and I'm from Department of English. So, like, it's very good to see you in person because I often uh, watch your videos talking about corruption, uh, very uh, like firmly. So, I also have a question on the corruption. Like, uh, out here in Nagore, uh, corruption is not uh, only about. Uh, Vector appointments or any such, but we also have a uh, uh, class uh, distinctions like uh, advanced drives or any paper drives. So, what do you think about uh, this manner? If you have any suggestions, thank you so much for bringing that up. <coughs> this issue is one where I've see, read the comments, huh? mm. and many people they want to. We need to address that. Also, thank you for bringing that. Now, the reason why there is advanced tribes and backward tribes is because of the British. Okay, the British ruled Nagaland only up to the Tizu River. So, those beyond the Tizu River, with the coming of statehood, were classified as backward tribes because they did not have the advantage of education. So that is where this advance in backward tribes came from. See, many people have uh, problems with Sunnis having reservation, huh? but it is not for all Sunnis. It is for those who come from across the Tizen River. Now, the problem with such reservations, even in India, 
Now, even in the case of Nagas in the union services, yes, we do not have the concept of the creamy layer. So only the rich, only the privileged are getting those jobs, which are meant for the reserve people. Now, so say you take, for example, the STs in the hill, uh, India, mainland India, you will see that they are so backward, but they are getting their privileges. Similarly, here among the backward tribes in Nagaland, it is only the children of the rich and the privileged who have access to good education that are getting the reservation. Whereas the villagers living there, they have no and their misery is being used to advance the backward tribe agenda. Say frontier Nagaland. I'm not against it, but it's not going to achieve anything. Because the same class of people who have exploited the Eastern Naga since statehood, they will be the ones in charge in frontier Nagaland. You will not see any visible changes. It is for us, for all of us to think and to raise the standards of living of our less fortunate brothers. And that has always been the purpose of my, whether I write or whether I talk, it is above the Nagas in the villages, the ones who are suffering. When I travel, when I see a Naga villager carrying a big load, I always get angry. What is the difference between they and me that I am driving in a car when it is having a on its head? It is because of the inequality of distribution of the privileges, the jobs and opportunities which the government of India gives us. So we have to address that. And it is very difficult because those who are enjoying the privileges are richer, they are more powerful. But what they do not realize is that if the pressure level, the anger of the people reach a certain level, which then things turn violent. And that is something which I've always been trying to avoid. So I don't know if you would be happy with what I have said, uh, but this concept of backward, no, uh, forward, uh, and it is it is a valid fact, but it is being misused by some. Yes. Sir, thank you so much for, for spending, spending your time for coming to Malaysia and speaking on such interesting topics. Sir, my name is Kawoto Jakalu from Postal Department of Arts and Mr. My question is, sir, since uh, Naka is being asking the government of India to give Nagaland as an independent country, sir, what if the Indian government accepts this issue and uh, makes Nagaland an independent country? And how do you think the independent Nagaland country will function in your view? How, how will the Naga country be? Thank you for bringing up again another very valid question. The reason why I say the NSN IM is very intelligent is because they knew about this a long time back. During the early days of the Naga insurgency, up to the 1960s, if we had received independence, we would have functioned as a, an agrarian state. No? Everybody living in his own villages, cultivating his own lands, uh, and maybe buying salt from the sand. But now we have tasted the benefits of a modern society. We cannot untaste it. So this is why the independence, no? that word has been changed to sovereignty. And many people, I try to bring it up in a sense, but they don't understand the distinction between independence and sovereignty. Independence is freedom. Freedom to rule ourselves to do everything. Sovereignty is the power to rule. So NSNIN has changed the narrative from independence 
to sovereignty and to share sovereignty. So what they're asking is not independence from India, but the right to rule the Naras. We cannot function if India were to give us independence within one month, we'll break out of the civil war. Because we have nothing. We, can, we, are, we cannot go back to our villages, start cultivating two fields. It is impossible. I have mentioned this a number of times. When I spoke with Mr. Arun Ravi, I told him, why don't you give us provisional independence for five years? No. Then you see Nagas clamoring to get back within, uh, to India within two months. No. But that is something which uh, India also will not take the risk of. No. Because by the time some other power might, uh, some other group or country might grab power here. So it is, independence is no longer feasible. Now you just have to go to YouTube. Okay, there's a free documentary, no? uh, the title. No? You look up Myanmar, you see how the Nagas there are living, no? compared to how they live here. Even the poorest Naga in India is living better than the okay, rich people in Myanmar. So, very valid question. With something, among my friends also, I have many of them no, who talk about the constitution, about independence, no, and I laugh at them, but I'm surprised at their stupidity. No? You understand, that's why you brought up this topic. No, we cannot survive as an independent nation unless each and every one of us is willing to go back to our villages to start farming. That's all. Once again, uh, I have a simple question. Uh, don't you think legalizing liquor shop in our state will be started? Legalizing liquor shop? Oh. Thank you so much. Prohibition. I don't know why the NBCC started to press for prohibition. But I'm a recovering drug addict. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I know exactly what an alcoholic does. No matter how difficult they make it for me to buy, I will go to any lens to purchase it. And these uh, moralists, no, people who have no experience, they, for them it is very easy to classify. No? Like drinking is a sin. It's not. Where in the Bible is it written that drinking is a sin? Jesus Christ's first miracle was making wine. They don't know the difference between an alcoholic and a social drinker. They don't know what drives a man to abuse his wife and children. They think it's because of drink. No. During this, uh, earlier I mentioned the moral expression of thing, no? Moral foundation. Uh, debate. I gave the examples of two of my brothers in law. Okay, my wife's elder sister's husbands. Both of them are alcoholics. But one beats his wife regularly. One is always joking with his wife. He's, in fact, his wife is on the verge of beating him. No? So, see, they make all of these stupid moralistic no, uh, conclusions based on an inaccurate knowledge of how poor people behave. They, they bring up these issues of the child abuse, uh, domestic abuse, and they use it to show up the argument for prohibition. And it is totally false. Forget about the revenue which sale of alcohol brings. 
take off the damage which spurious alcohol puts on the economy. Growing up, I grew up among drinkers. I drank. Prior to prohibition, I don't recall hearing of anyone dying of liver cirrhosis unless he happened to be 70 or above. Nowadays you see young people, 25, 30 years, dying of cirrhosis of liver. Can you imagine how what a toll prohibition has taken on in our society? You see young people going for drugs. During that same debate, that Naglen Medicine Dealers Association became. And it was very good of them to confess. They said that for them prohibition is good. Prior to prohibition, there were only 13 wholesale thing, drug dealers in Dimapur. Now it seems they have around 20 wholesalers. And all of them, they're selling uh, not a uh, thing, uh, genuine medicines for illnesses, no? but all these cough syrups and all no? pills which can get you hard. So this is the other side of prohibition, one which the NBCC refuses to see, which they refuse to address. They, they never came for the debate. They didn't reply to my article on the reduction of Christianity. The only feedback I got from the, my article on the reduction of Christianity, I, wrote, I think I believe I wrote that in 2021, December or something like uh, Our former Chief Minister K. Kishi, his elder brother, Dr. Bento, he called me up. And it seems uh, some members of the NBCC called him up saying that what Kawato wrote does not apply to all of us. All to us. And then it seems he replied, he told them, hey, please, I have not read the article, let me read it first. And then after he read it, he called me up to say he agreed with me on every issue. You know? So we we have this multitude of theological colleges, okay? At the last count, 1990, uh, no, 2000, that's 23 years ago, last count, there were 17 theological colleges in the Mapro Road. 17. I don't know how, how, how much they are now. Now, all these colleges, they have got no, uh, I don't believe they have any solid theological academic credentials. But those running these colleges are part of the thing, organized church. So they need to create employment for these graduates of this spurious Theological colleges. In one of my interviews, I said that you can get a theological college in Nala also. Uh, and this is the reason why all these prayer centers are sprouting up everywhere. You have prayer warriors. What is a prayer warrior? I don't understand. Who gives you the title of a prayer warrior? I believe only God can give you the title. Because he's the one hearing our prayers. He knows. Uh, Whose prayers are good, whose prayers are bad. So concepts like this, prohibition, huh? prayer warriors, act contributing. As far as I know, the Bible talks only of tithes. Tithe means ten percent of your earnings. Now you have donations for this and that. Uh, even uh, this uh, handful of rice, no? Huh? Every time you cook, you leave a handful of rice. Where does the rice go to? It is distributed among the donations. There's so much aid coming from thing, foreign countries. What did they do? They distributed among themselves. I heard a case where uh, some tourism, they contacted the children of, uh, grandchildren of uh, Billy Graham, and then they sent all these thing, nice uh, gift boxes for children on Children's Day, and then they distributed among the Are they getting paid? One, one of my old friends said that I, their pastor wants to buy a Scorpio. I said, hey, you want to house are still behind us. We soon as have moved in over us. <laughs> so, see, they prey on us. And to shore up their credibility, 
Okay, prohibition does not have any real theological uh, thing, foundation, but to show up their reputation as uh, blue fools, okay? Uh, to, sh to create a false image that they're doing something good for society, they endorse prohibition. They tell us to close shops on Sundays. So, until we understand the concept, and until we understand, the government does not need to consult the churches about any policy. The reason why there is a clear divide between the government and the church is because Europe spent centuries fighting against the poor. So now they understand that the church and government must be separate. But here, our government does that because they are, they are into corruption, so they appease every small section of society. And for them, if any revenue that comes from sale of liquor goes into the public uh, exchequer, whereas uh, the bootleggers, they give them straight into their pockets. So it is better for them to support prohibition. I think I, I digressed a bit, but I hope I can address the point. younger generation, you know, of the Nagas as an asset of the great Indian nation. I mean, how do you see that? See, I have great faith in Naga people, okay? Because I studied with non-Nagas. And I know that we are as good as any other people, if not better. No. But to bring about positive change, you have to understand that it lies in your hands. This is a problem with us. We always expect someone to come and do things for us. You have to understand it is for you to actively take part in issues which matter to you. It may be on any issue. But if you feel that it is a valid issue, you have to take part. This is the biggest weakness of the Nagas. We know it is right, uh, but uh, leave it. Leave it for somebody else to do. Now, I, in my last interview on the Bible today, I said that change throughout the history of the world, change has come only to the young people. Then one guy commented saying that Mahatma Gandhi was not a young man. You know? I can imagine the stupidity of that thing, as if Mahatma Gandhi was not born, you know? ultimately the old man. You know? Mahatma Gandhi started his journey of activism when he was 23, 23 or 24. So, you have to understand, because we come, we are primitive society. In primitive societies, things don't change, okay? You have to understand that. Things don't change, so whatever 
our elders say, since they are more experienced in the same thing, huh? when you keep repeating something, the older you become, the better you become at it. So we, are, we come from a society where we are used to accepting whatever our elders tell us. But that day and age is gone. You understand modern concepts better than I do. I learned so many things from Facebook, okay? In fact, you will not believe me. But I learned so many things from young people. And it is because of my interaction on Facebook, especially with young people, that I'm able to, uh, I'm able to address you. Okay? So you must understand that you influence people. Every word you write, Every opinion you express, it affects someone around you, in one way or the other. So you have to take charge of your future. You have to, starting with your college union, student union elections, take active part by at least voting for the right person, and if you believe you can contribute, then stand for election in your student councils. Because that is the only way you're going to bring about change. You see all the student leaders now, all crooks. Why? Because our environment is such that only crooks can flourish. So that is what I feel the Nagas must do. Uh, I have faith, I have hope. But I cannot do it for you. You have to do it for yourselves. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Dr. Lord Monabide. I'm from Uzora, actually. So, first of all, I want to say that I'm a great supporter of Naga nationalism because at one point of time, the Mizo and Naga shared the same history. We have this insurgency going on. And uh, today, what I would like to know is that uh, the Mizo are now having their uh, peace now with the Indian government, but the Naga still uh, cannot reach that stage. And what would be the reason for that? And uh, there could be certain reasons like due to the feelings of lands and tribes, or uh, is there any kind of ideology like uh, the Indian government trying to uh, popularize the idea of Indianization among the Naga people that hampers the peace process. So, uh, can you tell me your idea on that? How you uh, see that? Thank you very much for bringing up a very valid point. Like many people compare the Mizo insurgency with the Naga insurgency, but we have fundamental differences. The first is that the Mizo insurgency arose due to the panel. They uh, Mizoram to occasionally, you know, they have this powering of bamboo, bamboo powering, which leads, leads to an increase in the rat population and then which leads to a decrease in food production. So I've I, I gotten a year, but the government of India did not take any concrete steps to alleviate the suffering of the Mizo people during this panel. So that's the reason why the Mizo insurgents is power. Whereas in Nagaland, it is purely a political movement. Now, again, another fundamental difference is the mix of the population. Now, Mizoram, you have a nearly homogeneous population speaking one language. Huh? Here, we have so many tribes, and so many new tribes have been created every day. Huh? So, that is under India is taking advantage of that. There is, there is no doubt India is taking advantage of it. India is uh, not actively, hmm. but not proactively, but actively encouraging. Recently, I had a meeting with General Niki and uh, this uh, General Secretary is awesome, no? uh, So I told them. I ask that question because I see it this way. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so is this also kind of something that? That's true, I don't go. Uh, but I am the only Naga who has publicly 
owed my allegiance to the constitution of India. Okay, these politicians now, they, they do it now when they win the election, but that is for a different purpose. Why? Because I believe in the constitution of India. It is a good constitution. See, the fact that the people who enforce or sit in the institutions of India, say the Supreme Court, I have an issue with one of the former chief justices, but it does not mean that I don't trust in the institution of the Supreme Court of India. I don't trust in the, some people sitting there. So these things, India is also a new nation. So we also, India is also going through many uh, birth acts. When compared to other nations, India is still new. So that's understandable. But it is for us. See, I grew up with many music of things in school. No? So, your culture no, has remained intact. Okay, good culture. This morning I saw one very funny video, one Naga lying on the road and cutting in the grass, you know. Like not even bothering to the stand, you know. But this work culture of the measles, the fact that you have a nearly homogeneous population, and then see, you have the Young Measles Association, it is so powerful. But look at what our NSF has become. NSF also was once as powerful as the YMA. But he has been politicized, uh, we play tribal politics. So ENSF, they withdrew. So that is the difference. Uh, it's not a question of uh, India has done this or that. Okay, It is our own. Thing. Okay, uh, uh, let us talk about uh, the corruption. Uh, I think you must be reading uh, the articles that uh, our student writes. And I like what you just said, okay. There are certain things that we have to take the ownership of. The evils in the society, the problems in the society, the structural issues that I witness. Uh, I have been associated with the civil society organizations and the people and the students for over 10 years as a scholar, as a teacher. You know, I'm also a legal advisor of some of the organizations, right? So what I understand is that that the view that the younger generation is having, they're so purely egalitarian, right? They are universal in nature, right? They are the ones who believe in justice, equality, liberty, and fraternity. So uh, in this context, I want you to tell them that how these young people are going to challenge those problems that it has been created as a byproduct of some of the wrong decisions which has been taken in the land itself. What is your take on it, sir? Uh, when you uh, as earlier, see, you have to understand the power of public opinion. My greatest strength has been the power of public opinion. So, you have to uh, the young people, you have to elect good student leaders who will take forward the agenda of changing society. There's no other way. You cannot wait until you're old or you have to support someone who is visibly... See, this seems like self-promotion sort of thing. Huh? Mm. Because as far as I know, I'm the only visible guy who's speaking against all this. But it's okay. When you come across a person who speaks out on certain issues, it is not that you have to agree with him on everything. You have, if you agree with a person on the core issues, you must support him. The problem with Nagas is that, especially Sumitra, okay, if I have an issue with someone on one issue, I will be against him on a totally unrelated issue. See, now I see many comments, you now when I speak, they write, eh, you speak out against Theologians. Just because I spoke out once or twice against Theologians, now they're against me, whether I speak out against corruption, they're against me. Whether I speak out against the uh, other wrong, they say against me. 
So this attitude, we must learn to change this attitude, okay? You may not agree with a person on a certain issue, but if on another issue you agree with him, then you must support him. And that has always been my view. People are quite surprised. You know? Sometimes I support someone on one issue, sometimes on another issue I support another person. So you must learn to discern the issues and to give the support. You must learn to understand, you must understand that just because someone, okay, they're your parents or someone is elder than you, it does not necessarily mean that he is right or that you have to follow him. You have to learn to make decisions for yourself. That is certain. Regarding this uh, in rights of the women, see, Nagas traditionally, I don't think they have suppressed women to the extent that other societies have. The reason why women were kept in reserve was because head hunting. Uh, and women's head were more prized because they were more perfect. Now, when you look at Naga families across tribes, I don't think there are many instances where uh, the parents deprive the girl of education because uh, of financial problems. Huh? Like, usually either girl or boy, uh, whoever is the thing, are more capable or more interested, we tend to further the education. With regard to ULB, I was always against the 33 person reservation during the Congress time, okay? Not because I have anything against women, women, but because when you implement that, no, that means 33% of the constituencies are always there for women. Men cannot always from those constituencies. So the reverse discrimination principle comes into play. Men are discriminated against. Huh. Reverse discrimination, it's called reverse discrimination, okay? So I wrote an article, 2017 I believe, where I brought up this concept of uh, like Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha sort of thing. Uh, so, say there are 10 constituencies, so these 10 are uh, in 10 uh, wards in a town, so combine two wards each, huh? uh, for women to contest for. So the voter will vote once. One for my ward, one for the woman. I don't know if you get that concept, but you have 10 wards. So in the 10 wards, there are 10 councillors, okay? 10 councillors, whether it be men or women. But for the women, no? say ward one and two will be combined to form a woman, a ward for women. Contest. Only women can contest. Say one and two, three and four, five and six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that comes up to 33%. Mm. So there will be ten open thing, wards and five reserve open. And the voter will vote twice. One for the thing. If I'm from ward one, I will vote once for my ward member and one more time for the woman. Uh, the vote uh, from what to also will vote twice, uh, but his vote will be counted separately in the sense for what one and two separate and for what one and two combined for a woman. So that is the, the concept, I think. Okay, so another question would be, uh, would there ever be uh, a female Dambura, a female in our society? Regarding Dambura, see, Sumis, we have the concept, okay, where if the chief, no, the chief dies and leaves a young child, no, then his wife can take rule in his place until the son comes of age. 
But regarding other tribes, I, I don't think it has ever been there. No, what I mean is the traditional governing system, okay? Good. Now, the Washis, why, why can't they be the Washis? The Washis are just interpreters. No, we don't have so fast. But we can have. But the problem is this the washing system. I've mean, addressed this before in our college, no? This is again one of the biggest uh, institutions of injustice in Africa. It does not affect us, but it affects the villages. This the washies, they act like the be all and end all of uh, customary law. And even uh, this law, in, uh, I came across a law textbook which says that a judgment by the worship court no? uh, is the ultimate judgment, no? which is patently false because I have challenged them and I have won against them. Also. So this Dabashi thing, system needs to be streamlined. Politicians and uh, Now, this, this takes me to another interesting observation. Mm -hmm. You have been speaking about the customary laws. I have studied how customary laws, even I am very much familiar with the Santal customary laws also. Uh, so what I found was, with my limited knowledge, that each tribe has its own customary laws and evolve over the period of time, different perspectives. Maybe some commonalities with, uh, might be there. But customary laws are distinctly different. Okay, even if you compare the Kimungan's customary law, Kimungan's perspective to the world, how their system has evolved over the period of time. I'm familiar with that also, right? So, so Kimungan customary law is totally different from the Ao or maybe Angami customary law. Now, coming back to the uh, debate regarding the constitution, right? That how this, considering the diversities that we have, when the every Naga tribe evolved distinctly in a fortified environment as an independent republic over the period of thousands of years. And they evolved their own legal system also in the context of the customary law, right? How that varieties of laws, how that diversity are going to be incorporated in the discourse of the Yazab. I just want to know that. See, this is what I mean about the Yazab. No, uh, the Indian constitution in Article 371 has given us the right to practice our customary laws. So we don't need the Yazab to tell us that. And the Yazabo, as I said earlier, they are two totally different Yazabos. The NNC and GM Yazabo, which takes into consideration the customary laws of the different tribes. And the NSN IM Yazabo, or NSN Yazabo, not IM alone, which totally takes away all customary laws, all rights. Now, Regarding the thing, the differences in the customary law of the different tribes, I have proposed no, that all criminal laws should come under the IPC. And civil laws, especially land inheritance, like every tribe keep its own thing. Uh, customary law, that will create a go a, a long way into take, taking away the confusion of this customary law. Because we have to understand that our customary law, especially in criminal cases, is very primitive. Because now that we didn't have much crime. Hardly any rape, hardly any murder, a small theft. That these, these are only three crimes. So in a modern society, you know, you cannot cover all the crimes under these three heads. So the state assembly should pass laws of this. Okay, sir, uh, regarding your view on the 33%, uh, I think there is uh, a little bit misunderstanding uh, in the sense that the reservation of 33% doesn't mean that 33% seat will be directly owned by the woman. That means uh, if we say that it is MLA uh, seat 33%, 33% of the seat will be uh, directly given to uh, women. They will contest and if they won, they will be uh, in the MLA. And if they don't win, they, are, they will be uh, in the MLA. So therefore, I think this reservation 
needs to be reconsidered, especially uh, regarding the women reservation. Because in the other state also, they practice it. And uh, if the woman wound, then it's OK. And the male also can contest, and the male can also win the seat. So therefore, I think there's a little bit misconception here. I think, no, I think when you talk about 33% reservation, it means that 33% of the seats are only for women to call their seat. Men cannot call their seat, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, no. Are you sure? Because in that event, you don't need reservation for women. They can contest anything. I think uh, the way we have a uh, reservation uh, for uh, you know the Shepherd class candidates, right? Uh, and uh, there are some constituencies reserved for the Shepherd class, and uh, no other candidate can contest on that. Huh? Okay, like for example, there are four parties, and if a specific uh, constituency reserved for that specific category, then all the candidates belonging to different party belong to that category can only contest that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is what the idea is. I think woman, what do you say? Like woman reservation will also be like that? Yeah, they have like 33% reservation seats and uh, that means they will be given the candidate seat. And if they are elected, then they are elected. If they are not elected, then they are not elected. See, again, uh, uh, one professor, Amiruda, uh, oh, he's saying that He's also agreeing with me in the fact, in the sense that it is reserved for only women. Now, what you're saying is that the political parties now, now, will select only women. Now, so it comes out to say, now it is reserved for women, that's why only women are not this. Contest in the other seats. Okay, yeah. Thirty-three percent is reserved for women, and they co they can contest in the other sixty-six percent. Uh, uh. I think that's what you're meaning. No, uh, uh. but thirty-three percent is reserved for. We have so many things to discuss, but due to time constraint, we will put a close to this. I'll start with um, one question. Since you have emphasized so much on uh, egalitarian society, and as you mentioned in your speech, that the root cause of corruption, uh, the root cause of our society's menace today is corruption, and the vicious cycle continues. And so if you have envisaged the idea of an egalitarian society, what would be the first step that we should take to move towards an egalitarian society? Is my question. See, I believe the government of India you know, has programs which try to address this inequality society. So for us, it is for us to see that it is implemented in full and properly. I think that's the only way. Uh, because economic freedom uh, is the most important freedom. Without economic freedom, no other freedom is paid worldwide. So unless we improve the living standards of the poor, no, we cannot move, uh, achieve any guarantee of any good society. So these programs should be implemented. Thank you, sir. Sir, it was really nice having you. We all had a thought-provoking session, and we have learned a lot from you. We continue to support you, and we continue to look forward, put our trust on you, that one day you will bring a change to our society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, honorable uh, guest speaker, uh, Kangku Shishi, uh, respected teachers and uh, students. On behalf of the Department of Political Science, I would like to thank you for sharing your wisdom, sharing your thoughts about the Nano issues.
and speaking so clearly and uh, passionately about all the issues. And I feel that one of the major contributions that such interaction would have in society is that it produces a dialogue among society about issues. You may have differences of opinions, some may be in favor, some may be against, but nevertheless, what is the need of the hour is to have a dialogue among the different tribes, among the society, in relation to all the other stakeholders. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the organizer, especially uh, Dr. Anirita Larete, for uh, managing the event quite well. Special, uh, I would also like to especially mention our ancestors, who actually did a tremendous job in organizing and helping us in all the tidbits of uh, this event. And I would also like to thank the students for making this interaction very interesting, for asking very relevant questions, including our teachers. And I think this, uh, belonging from political science department, I would like to say that uh, having such interaction is actually what uh, defines a society towards, you know, actually moving on, bringing change, if that is what we aspire to. So following that tradition, I would like to again thank you each and everyone, and again uh, to Mr. Kaupu Jishi for sharing your time with us, having such an uh, elaborate discussion with each and everyone. So thanks a lot, and thank you everyone.